I hope what I am going to say now will meet most of the points raised by you in our discussions. Anesa, Dukkha and Anatta are the three essential elements in Buddha's teaching. If you know Anesa truly, you know Dukkha also as a sequel and Anatta as the ultimate truth. It takes time to understand the three together. Anesa is of course the essential factor which must be first experienced and understood by practice. A mere reading of the books on Buddhism or book knowledge of Buddha Dhamma will not be enough for the understanding of true Anesa because the experiential aspect will be missing. It is only through experience and understanding of the nature of Anesa as an ever-changing process within your very self that you can understand Anesa in the way Buddha would like you to understand. This understanding of Anesa can be developed as in the days of Buddha by persons who have no book knowledge whatsoever of Buddhism. To understand Anesa, one must follow strictly and diligently the Eightfold Noble Path, which is divided into three steps of Sila, Samadhi and Pinya. Sila or virtuous living is the base for Samadhi, control of mind to one-pointedness. It is only when Samadhi is good that one can develop Pinya. So Sila and Samadhi are the prerequisites for Pinya. By Pinya is meant the understanding of Anesa, Dukkha and Anatta through the practice of Vipassana. Whether a Buddha has arisen or not, this practice of sila and samadhi are present in the world of mankind. In fact, they are the common denominators of all religious faith. They are, however, not the means for the end, that is, the end of suffering. In his search for this end of suffering, Prince Siddhartha found this out and he walked his way through to find the path which will lead to the end of suffering. After solid work for six years, he found the way out, became completely enlightened, and then taught men and gods to follow the path which leads them to the end of suffering. In this connection, I should like to explain that each action, either by deed, word, or thought, leaves behind a force of action, sankhara, or karma in popular term, which goes to the credit or debit account of the individual according as the action is good or bad. There is therefore accumulation of sankhara or karma with everyone which becomes the source of supply of energy to sustain life, which invariably is followed by suffering and death. It is by the development of power inherent in the understanding of Anesa, Dukkha and Anatta that one is able to rid oneself of sankhara which becomes accumulated in one's own personal account. This process begins with the true understanding of Anesa, while further accumulations for fresh actions and reductions for the supply of energy to sustain life are taking place simultaneously from time to time and day to day. It is therefore a matter of a lifetime or more to get rid of all one's own sankhara or karma. He who has got himself rid of all sankharas or karma come to the end of suffering because by them there is no remainder of his sankhara to give the necessary life energy to sustain him in any form of life. This end of the suffering is reached by the Buddha and the Arhats on the termination of their lives when they passed into pre-Nibbana. For us today, who take to Vipassana meditation, it should suffice if we can understand Anesa very well and reach the stage of an area, a sort of party who will not live more than seven lives to come to this end of suffering. This Anesa, which opens the door to the understanding of Dukkha and Anatta and then leads to the end of suffering eventually, can be encountered only through a Buddha or after he has passed away through his teaching for so long as that relating to the Eightfold Noble Bath and the 37 factors of enlightenment, that is body back here, remains intact 
and available to the aspirant. For progress in Vipassana meditation, a student must keep knowing Anesa as continuously as possible. The Buddha's advice to monks is that they shall try to maintain the awareness of Anesa or Dukkha or Anatta in all postures, whether sitting or standing or walking or lying down. The continuity of awareness of Anesa and so of Dukkha and Anatta is the secret of success. The last word of Buddha just before he breathed his last and passed away into Mahaprinibbana was, Decay or Anesa is inherent in all component things. Work out your own salvation with diligence. This is in fact the essence of all his teaching during the 45 years of his lifetime. If you will keep up the awareness of Anesa that is inherent in all component things, you are sure to reach the goal in the course of time. In the meanwhile, as you develop in the understanding of Anesa, your insight into what is true of nature will become greater and greater. So much so that eventually you will have no doubt whatsoever of the three characteristics of Anesa, Dukha and Anatta. It is then only that you are in a position to go ahead for the goal in view. Now that you know Anesa is the first essential factor, you should try to understand what Anesa is with real clarity and as extensively as possible so as not to get confused in the course of practice or discussion. The real meaning of Anesa is impermanence or decay. That is the inherent nature of impermanence and decay in everything that exists in this universe, whether animate or inanimate. To make my work of explanation easy for the present day generation, I might draw attention to the opening sentences of the chapter Atomic Contents in the book Inside the Atom by Isaac Asimov and also to a portion of the contents at page 159 of the book about chemical reactions going on at the same time in all parts of the body of a living creature such as a human being. This should be sufficient to bring home the point of view that all things, different as they were, are made of tiny particles called atoms. These atoms have been proved by science to be in a state of arising and dissolution or change. We should accordingly accept the concept of Buddha that all component things are subject to change, decay, or anesa. But in expounding the theory of anesa, Buddha started with the behavior which makes matter and the matter, as known to Buddha, is very much smaller than the atom which the science of today has discovered. Buddha made it known to his disciples that everything that exists in this universe, whether animate or inanimate, is composed of kalapas, very much smaller than atoms, each dying out simultaneously as it becomes. Each kalapa is a mass formed of the eight nature elements namely Patavi, Abo, Izo, Vayo, Vanna, Ganda, Rasa, and Oja. The first four are called material qualities, which are predominant in the Kalapa. The other four are merely subsidiaries, which are dependent upon and born out of the former. A Kalapa is the minutest particle in the physical plane, still beyond the range of science of today. It is only when the eight nature elements, which have merely the characteristic of behavior, are together that the entirety of a kalapa, the tiniest of matter in the physical plane, is formed. In other words, the coexistence for a moment of these eight nature elements of behavior makes a mass just for that moment, which in Buddhism is known as kalapa. The size of a kalapa is about 1 over 46,656 part of a particle of dust from the wheel of a chariot in summer of India. The lifespan of a kalapa is a moment, there being a trillion such moments in the wink of an eye of a human being. These kalapas are all in a state of perpetual change or flux. To a developed student in vipassana meditation, they can be felt as a stream of energy. 
The human body is not an entity as it seems to be, but a continuum of an aggregate of matter, rupa, with life force, nama, coexisting. To know that our very staff is composed of tiny color parts, all in a state of change, is to know what is true of nature of change or decay. This nature of change or decay, anisa, occasioned by the continual breakdown and replacement of kalapas, all in a state of combustion, must necessarily be identified with dukkha only, the truth of suffering. It is only when you experience impermanence as dukkha that you come to the realization of the truth of suffering of the Four Noble Truths on which so much emphasis has been laid in the teaching of Buddha. Why? Because you realize this subtle nature of Dukkha from which you cannot escape for a moment. You would become truly afraid of, disgusted with and disinclined to your very existence with Rupa and Nama and look out for a way to escape to a state beyond, that is beyond Dukkha and so to the end of suffering. What that end of suffering would be like, you will be able to have a taste of it, even so as a human being, when you reach the level of a sort of pati and is developed well enough by practice to go into the unconditioned state of peace of nibbana within. Be that as it may, for everyday life, no sooner than you are able to keep up the awareness of Anesa in practice, you will know for yourself that a change is taking place in you both physically and, and mentally for the better. Before entering upon the practice of Vipassana meditation, that is, after Samadhi has been developed to a proper level, a student should first be acquainted with the theoretical knowledge of Rupa, Metta, and Nama, mind and mental properties. If he has understood these well in theory, and has come to the proper level of Spandi, there is every likelihood of his understanding Anisa, Dukhan, and Nata in the true sense of the words of Buddha. In Vipassana meditation, one contemplates not only upon the changing nature, Anisa, of Rupa or Metta, but also upon the changing nature, Anisa, of Nama that is thought elements of attention projected towards the process of change of rupa or matter. At times the attention will be on anesa of rupa or metta only. At times the attention may be on anesa of thought elements nama. When one is contemplating upon anesa of rupa or matter, one realizes also that the thought element arising simultaneously with the awareness of anesa of rupa or matter are also in a state of transition or change. In that case, you are knowing Anesa of both Rupa and Nama together. All I have said so far relates to the understanding of Anesa through body feeling of the process of change of Rupa or matter, and also of thought elements depending upon such changing processes. You should know also that anesa can be understood through other types of feeling as well. Anesa can be developed through feeling one by contact of visible form with the sense organ of eye, two by contact of sound with the sense organ of ear, three by contact of smell with the sense organ of nose, four by contact of taste with the sense organ of tongue, five by contact of touch with the sense organ of body, six, by contact of thoughts with the sense organ of mind. In fact, one can develop the understanding of Anesa through any of the six organs of sense. In practice, however, we have found out that of all the types of feeling, the feeling by contact of touch with the component parts of the body covers a wide area for introspective meditation. Not only that, the feeling by contact of touch, by way of friction, radiation, and vibration of the kalapas within, with the component parts of the body, is more tangible than other types of feeling. And therefore, a beginner in vipassana meditation 
can come to the understanding of anesa more easily through body feeling of the nature of change of rupa or matter. This is the main reason why we have chosen the body feeling as a medium for quick understanding of anesa. It is open to anyone to try other means, but my suggestion is that one should have oneself well established in the understanding of anesa through body feeling before an attempt is made through other types of feeling. There are ten levels of knowledge in vipassana, namely one samasana, that is appreciation of anesa, dukkha and anatta by close observation and analysis, of course theoretically. Two, udhyavaya, that is knowledge of the arising and dissolution of rupa and nama. Three, Benga, that is knowledge of the fast changing nature of Rupa and Nama as a swift flow of current or a stream of energy. Four, Baya, that is knowledge of the fact that this very existence is dreadful. Five, Adinawa, that is knowledge of the fact that this very existence is full of evils. Six, Nebida, that is knowledge of the fact that this very existence existence is disgustful. Seven, Mongjitu Kamyata, that is knowledge of the urgent need to escape from this very existence. Eight, Pati Chankha, that is knowledge of the fact that time has come to work with full realization for salvation with Anesa at the base. Nine, Sankharu Pekha, that is knowledge of the fact that the stage is now set to get detached from Sankara and to break away from ego centralism. Then Anuloma, that is knowledge that would accelerate the attempt to reach the goal. These are the levels of attainments which one gets through during the course of Vipassana meditation, which in the case of those who reach the goal in a short time, they can be known only in retrospect. With the progress in the understanding of Anesa, one gets through these levels of attainment, subject, however, to adjustment or help at certain levels by a competent teacher. One should avoid to look forward to such attainments in anticipation, as this will distract him from the continuity of awareness of Anesa, which alone can and will give him the desired reward. Let me now deal with vipassana meditation from the point of view of a householder in everyday life and explain the benefits one can derive from it here and now in this very lifetime. The initial object of vipassana meditation is to activate nesa in one's own self or to experience one's own inner self in anesa and to get eventually to a state of inner and outer calmness and balance. This is achieved when one becomes engrossed in the feeling of anesa within. The world is now facing serious problems threatening mankind. It is just the right time for everyone to take to vipassana meditation and to learn how to find a deep pool of quiet in the midst of all that is happening today. Anesa is inside of everybody. It is with everybody. It is within reach of everybody. Just a look into his own self, and there it is, the Anesa to be experienced. When one can feel Anesa, when one can experience Anesa, and one, when, when one can become engrossed in Anesa, one can at will cut away from the wall of ideation outside. Anesa is for the householder, the gem of life, which he will treasure to create a reservoir of calm and balanced energy for his own well-being and for the welfare of the society. Anesa, when properly developed, strikes at the root of one's physical and mental ills and removes gradually whatever is bad in him, that is, the cause of such physical and mental ills. In the life time of Buddha, there were some 70 million people in Savatthi and places around 
in the kingdom of Kasenari Kosla. Of them, about 50 million were Ariyas who had passed into the stream of Sota Pati. The number of householders who took two vipassana meditation must therefore be more. Vipassana is not reserved for men who have renounced the world for our homeless life. It is for the householder as well. Now the time clock of Vipassana is struck. Now the time clock of Vipassana is struck. In spite of drawbacks which make householders restless in these days, a competent teacher or guide can help a student to get an answer activated in him in a comparatively short time. Once he got it activated, all that is necessary would be for him to try and preserve it. But he must make it a point as soon as time or opportunity presents itself for further progress to work out for the stage of Benga, the third level of knowledge in Vipassana. If he reaches this level, there will be little or no problem because he should then be able to experience Anisa without much ado and almost automatically. In this case, Anisa shall become his base for the return there too of all physical and mental activities outside the body as soon as the domestic needs of daily life for such activities are over. There is likely, however, to be some difficulty with one who has not as yet reached the stage of Banga. It will be just like a tug of war for him between Anisa with him and physical and mental activities outside the body. So it would be wise for him to follow the motto of work while you work, play while you play. There is no need for him to be activating Anisa all the time. It should suffice if this could be confined to the regular period or periods set apart in the day or night for the purpose. During this time, at least, attempt must be made to keep the mind attention inside the body with the awareness exclusively of Anisa. That is to say, this awareness of Anisa should be from moment to moment or so continuous as not to allow for interpolation of any discursive or distracting thoughts which are definitely detrimental to progress. In case this is not possible, you would have to go back to respiration mindfulness because samadhi is the key to anisa. To get good samadhi, sila has to be perfect since samadhi is built upon sila. For good anisa, samadhi must be good. If samadhi is excellent, awareness of anisa will also become excellent. There is no special technique for activating anisa other than the use of mind set to a perfect state of balance and attention projected to the object of meditation. In Vipassana, the object of meditation is anisa, and therefore, in the case of those who are used to drawing back their attention to body feeling, they can feel anisa directly. In experiencing anisa on or in the body, it should first be in the area where one can easily get his attention engrossed. Changing the area of attention from place to place, from head to feet and from feet to head, at times probing into the in interior. At this stage, it must be clearly understood that no attention is to be paid to the anatomy of the body, but right to the formation of matter, kalapas, and the nature of their constant change. If these instructions are observed, there will surely be progress, but the progress depends also on parami and the devotion of the individual to the work of meditation. As he attains higher levels of knowledge, his power to understand the three characteristics of anisa, dukkha and anatta will also increase and he will accordingly become nearer and nearer to the goal of area which every householder should keep in view. This is the age of science. Man of today has no utopia. He will not accept anything unless the results are good, concrete, vivid, personal, and here and now. 
When Buddha was alive, he said to the Kalamas, Now look you Kalamas, be not misled by report or tradition or hearsay. Be not misled by proficiency in the collections, nor by reason of logic, nor after reflection on and approval of some theory, nor because it conforms with one's inclination, nor out of respect for the prestige of a teacher. But Kalamas, when you know for yourselves these things are unwholesome, these things are blameworthy, these things are censured by the intelligent, these things when practiced and observed conduce to loss and sorrow, then indeed do ye reject them. But if at any time you know of your selves, these things are wholesome, they are blameless, they are praised by the intelligent. These things, when practiced and observed, conduce to welfare and happiness. Then, Kalamas, do ye, having practiced them, abide therein. The time clock of Vipassana is now struck. That is, for the revival of Buddha Dhamma, the Vipassana in practice. We have no doubt whatsoever about definite results accruing to those who would with open mind, sincerely undergo a course of training under a competent teacher. I mean results which will be accepted as good, concrete, vivid, personal, and here and now. The results which will keep them in good stead, in a state of well-being and happiness for the rest of their lives. May all beings be happy and may peace prevail in the world.